The twelfth chapter of Acts, which we read together this evening, is dominated really by two themes and three people. The two themes emerge throughout the whole of the chapter. The three people are, as you might obviously gather from verses 1 to 3, Herod, the king of Judah, James, the brother of John, and Peter, the disciple of Jesus and his apostle in the early church. And the events of the chapter in which they are involved together highlight the two themes, which are, first of all, the power of Satan, its reality, its ugliness, and its painfulness in the experience of God's people and God's church. And secondly, the power of God in its sovereign supremacy over every other power that men and women may know in the world. There is a sense in which, of course, these two themes are the twin themes of the whole of the book of Acts. You discover that the manifestation of the power of God is a regular recurring theme in the Acts of the Apostles. Again and again God displays His power, for example, at Pentecost in the preaching of the Apostle Peter himself in the ingathering of multitudes into the church and in its establishment in a pagan society. No sooner, however, has the power of God began, begun to be demonstrated in that way than you discover the powers of darkness set against the power of God and the people of God because Satan does not lightly take the breaching of his kingdom. And so you discover the apostles who are at the very center of this work of God's grace are put in prison and commanded that they speak no more in the name of Jesus. So the church goes to prayer in Acts chapter 4. And in answer to prayer, the power of God comes down upon His people, and the Word of God advances remarkably. And then Satan begins again to let loose his shafts and to bring his power to bear upon the church, this time not an assault from outside, but an assault from inside, and he raises up two people, Ananias and Sapphira from within the church of Jesus Christ, and they begin to produce what the apostles describe as a work of Satan. Why has Satan filled your hearts to lie to the Holy Spirit? And they have to deal with this, and God has to deal with it, and his power is revealed in judgment. And the church again begins to know the power of God and they advance and they glory in the growth of the Word of God. And then you discover Satan again setting about them and beginning to let loose his power, this time not with moral equivalence but with the whole question of quarreling and division and criticism within the church. And Acts chapter 6 tells us the story of how the Greek believers and the Jewish believers began to quarrel with each other. One party felt deprived and the other began to feel resentment towards them. And there was danger in the church. And the apostles again began to recognize something needs to be done here and they set themselves to the business of choosing out seven men and they reorganized the church so that prayer and the ministry of the Word might have a priority. And Stephen was raised up 
and became one of the mighty figures God used in these early days. And it seemed as though in this man full of the Holy Ghost and of power, there was going to be some amazing triumph for the gospel. And then he was martyred. And the power of Satan began to appear again in all its ugliness. And so you could go on seeing the raising up of Saul of Tarsus to be God's servant and Christ's apostle in the early church. But the whole of Acts is this kind of demonstration of the power of God and the power of Satan, the forces of the Lord Jesus Christ and the forces that oppose him. Now, that's not just the account of the book of Acts, of course. That is precisely the experience of every genuine Christian man or woman in their own life. The Christian life is not one long, smooth journey across untroubled seas to glory. The Christian life is filled with such real experiences of the power and grace and reality of God, followed by the assaults of the evil one sometimes through circumstances, disappointment, trial, tragedy even, as here in this chapter that we read this evening. But the realistic picture of Christian experience is not that we are happy all the day long. God knows we will know something of the joy of God in our lives. God knows there is nothing that is more glorious than living the Christian life. But the reality of the powers of darkness are as nakedly real today as they were in this day. And we will know what it is to say with the Apostle Paul, we wrestle, and not against flesh and blood, but against principalities and powers, against spiritual darkness in heavenly places. Now, this is the conflict that they are experiencing here in chapter 12. And these three lives are caught up into it. The life of Herod the king, the life of James the servant of Jesus Christ, and the life of Peter, once denier, now bond slave of Jesus. Now I want us to look at this chapter and at what unfolds in it through the lives of these three men. First, Herod the king. I suppose there is a sense in which everybody who reads the Bible find something of a shiver going through their spirit at the very name of Herod. What a family they were, evil, ruthless, cruel, and rotten to the core. And it's an extraordinary thing to think that there are generations of them. It's a very striking thing to me, you know, that when a godly man and woman set up a family, as yesterday we stood in this church and saw Duncan Brown and Ruth Farrer so gladly give themselves to Jesus Christ that their life together might be something for His glory. And what a joy such weddings are. But when a man and woman in Christ set up such a family, my dear friends, there is something potential for history that is altogether glorious here. And we know something of that in the names that have so blessed the church of God down through the years in some of these great families. The families of people who have been singularly used and blessed of God. Hudson Taylor's family to quote but one example. 
has branches that still exist in the modern contemporary scene and they are still touched by the grace of God. It is true in America. The family that Jonathan Edwards belonged to is a family that had enriched American life by the grace of God and the things that have happened through members of that family are altogether wonderful and glorious. By contrast, I've been reading, I was saying to some of you recently, one of the more recent biographies of the Kennedy family. And what a tragic saga that makes. What corruption, what filth there is that flows through that family so that the family line is almost an American sewer. And it was so with Herod. This one was the grandson of the Herod, Herod who slaughtered hundreds of babies at birth at the time of Jesus in the hope that one of these might be the new king of the Jews. His uncle was the one who beheaded John the Baptist at the behest of a silly little dancing girl. Another member of his family was the Herod who mocked Jesus and dressed him up and sent him to Pilate we read in Luke chapter 23. Now this Herod, the king at the beginning of chapter 12, had bought the throne of Judea, having been a great friend of the mad emperor Caligula. And to keep it, he tried to get on the right side of the Jews. Now if ever you see the evidence of the power of Satan in all its naked horror, you see it in this man. May I just point out to you what has been happening in his life. The corruption that Satan is producing in him because there is a process going on. Have you ever realized that just as there is a process of sanctification going on in the believer that changes them from glory into glory until they have the likeness of Jesus when they awaken his presence. There is in the same and opposite sense a process of corruption when someone gets into the hands of the evil one. And it was happening with this man. The devil in the first place was weakening his character. Herod was reputed by nature to be something of a naturally mild man. But in order to get on the right side of the Jews, we read that he laid violent hands, as the RSV translates it. He laid violent hands upon some who belonged to the church. The NIV says he arrested some who belonged to the church, intending to persecute them. Incidentally, it's very significant that violence is almost never a sign of strength. It is normally a sign of weakness of character and deficiency in personality. And the weakening of Herod's character began with that satanic self-inflation which gave the man high notions of himself which come to their climax in verse 21 did you notice near the end of our reading where on this appointed day Herod wearing his royal robes sat on his throne and delivered a public address to the people. They shouted this is the voice of a God not of a man. And immediately because Herod did not give praise to God an angel of the Lord struck him down. 
the secular historians tell us that Herod led an increasingly extravagant, dissolute life of vulgar self-display. And to keep the throne and the pride and power that went with it, he began to curry favor with the Jews. Do you notice that this was what motivated him in verse 3 in arresting Peter when he saw that this pleased the Jews, he proceeded to seize Peter also. It is again a mark of a weakening of a man's character when the motivation of his life becomes the pleasing of other people at all costs. Do you know that kind of thing? Buying their appreciation and approval. And this was part of the corrupting of Herod's character. It was so with Pilate, that other weak figure, who handed Jesus over to them to please the Jews. And so his character was weakened. The other thing that clearly begins to happen is that his conscience is hardened. He laid violent hands upon some in the church and then set about beheading James, the brother of John, in verse 2. Now, significantly, instead of fleeing from the scene with remorse and shame and a sense of guilt and horror at his action, he saw that it pleased the Jews and he set about arresting Peter also clearly with a purpose of charging and executing him. And with his character weakened and his conscience hardened, he became brutalized in his mind and a tool of Satan. The terrible thing is that when Satan had finished with him, the last note in the story is that he abandoned him and left him to rot. That, of course, is precisely the story of so many lives characters that are weakened by satanic power as they yield to it, consciences seared and hardened, minds brutalized until lives are left on the scrap heap by the devil. And he is in the habit of doing precisely this. Now I want to point out to you where the power of God is seen in this story. For in verses 21 to 23, we have the evidence of the revelation of the power of God. It might well have seemed, we don't know how long all this went on for, but it might well have seemed to God's people that this wicked, evil man was progressing in his wickedness and there seemed no divine hand to stay him. But there came a moment when God manifested his power and spoke and said, This is enough. Here is a man who is blessed feeming my name, and an angel of the Lord was sent to smite him to death. And that's the manifestation of the power of God. You do realize that God reveals his power in judgment as well as in blessing, don't you? 
That's an important principle for us to grasp. God is a God who judges iniquity. And although the mills of God grind slowly, they grind exceeding small. And there is never an occasion whether it be in this world or at the end of, th of this life, when God is mocked by people like Herod. There is a principle that so many people have thought that they could ignore or flout, you know. But the apostle has written it with crystal clarity for us. God is not mocked. Whatever a man sows, that will he also reap. And the power of God in the life and family of Herod was revealed in dreadful judgment. Now what's the message of that as we look at Herod? It is that ultimate power does not belong to Satan or his minions or his dominion. Ultimate power belongs to God. And when we are talking about these two evidences of the power of God and the power of Satan, we are not talking about equal and opposite forces. It's a very vital thing for us to grasp that. There is a mistaken understanding of what lies at the heart of the universe which people often call dualism. That is, that there is a power that belongs to God which is at work in the world and a power that comes from hell which is also at work in the world and that these two are vying against each other and we are waiting like some thriller story to ask what is going to happen in the end. Well, I want to say to you this evening, there is no such doubt in this situation. For the power of God is absolute. And the power of Satan is limited. There are all sorts of different ways in which that's exhibited in Scripture. In a personal sense, do you remember how it's exhibited in the story of Job? When Satan is going to and fro over the earth and God comes to him and says to him, Have you considered my servant Job? And he is challenging Satan with the quality of Job's life and godliness. Do you grasp this? The sheer wonder of the life of a man who is used by God to challenge Satan. Have you considered my servant Job? He says. And Satan says to God, does Job serve God for nothing? That is, is he not serving you for what he is getting out of it? Just wait to see what would happen if the things that he holds most dear are snatched from him. If his health, his family or whatever are touched. And God then gives Satan permission. There is a remarkable account of how Satan asks God for the freedom to go and assault Job, and God gives him permission but says to him, there is one thing you must not touch. Do not touch this. Do not touch that. He says, there is a limit to what you may do. And the picture is that Satan is, as it were, on chain to the hand of God, and it is God who determines how far 
he may go in attacking his servant. But the place where we ultimately know, of course, that the power of Satan has already been broken by the power of God is in the cross and resurrection of Jesus Christ where by his death and resurrection he has entered into the darkness of Satan's palaces and destroyed the power of darkness. So that we sing in these resurrection hymns, O death, we defy thee, a stronger than thou hast entered thy palace, we fear thee not now. O sin, thou art vanquished, thy long reign is o'er. Now this is where we have the evidence ultimately of the defeat of the powers of darkness and know that it is only a matter of time until the power of Satan is publicly banished from the earth. So we need to grasp, not only for the sake of right thinking, but for the sake of right living, what the Apostle John writes to those whom he is encouraging in Christian assurance. Greater is he that is in you than he that is in the world. Now look with me more briefly at James. It was obviously the power of Satan at work in Herod that brought James into prison at the beginning of chapter 12. He arrested some who belonged to the church intending to persecute them, and one of these was clearly James. Now, it's a very significant thing, I think, that what we might well have expected was that James, by the power of God, would be delivered out of prison. And that Herod, the servant of Satan, might not be permitted to touch him. And when we read to the end of the chapter and know that that's precisely what happened to Peter, the church of God prayed. Now, I am absolutely certain that when James was put in prison, the church of God went to prayer also. But you notice the mysterious way in which the power of God is employed. It is the same sovereign God with gracious care for His people who on the one hand permits James to be beheaded, and on the other, delivers Peter out of prison. What was wrong? Could it be that in James's case, the power of God was defective or limited in some sense? Well, of course not, but what had happened was that in the midst mysterious providences of God, he was permitting James to be beheaded and to die for his glory, as he permitted Peter to be released and to live for his glory. There we touch upon one of the things that, of course, covers God's people with an utter sense of mystery and bafflement. How is it that a God who has at his fingertips, as it were, such power allows such a thing to happen? But happen it did, and in the mystery of God's purposes, 
he displays his power in different ways. He displayed it in Herod's case in judgment. He displays it in James's case in committing him to the suffering and death. And he displays it in Peter's case in delivering him from bondage. Now you see, this is where we need to recognize that God's sovereign and supreme power is married to the other element in God's character, which is his sovereign and supreme wisdom. And the power of God is always married to the wisdom of God. Thank God for that. I say that because the one thing that would cause me to tremble would be if God put the exercise of his power into the hands and under the wisdom of anyone else except himself. I have great respect for you as my friends, and many of you I've known for many years. But I say to you, no matter which one of us was given the power to exercise God's power according to our wisdom, I would tremble at the possibilities. And in the case of James, God glorified himself by his death as he glorified himself through Peter's deliverance. Now, it's a great test of how much we have confidence, not in ourselves, but in the wisdom and power and providences of God, that we are ready to say with Job, the Lord gave, and the Lord has taken away, blessed be the name of the Lord. Now you may say it's easy for him up there in a pulpit to say that kind of thing. But many of you know that years ago I stood by the grave of my only brother who at the age of 29 and just some months after he was married died of cancer. And I heard his wife of the age of 26 repeat, the Lord gave and the Lord has taken away. Blessed be the name of the Lord. And that happens in all sorts of different ways. We had Ronnie Stevens here in the prayer meeting along with Scott Murray on a memorable evening last Wednesday. And Ronnie Stevens came to this country partly to talk over the whole question of the mystery of his being taken out of Moscow. He had lived for years longing to serve God in this place. He had abandoned the prospects of a career in the United States of America in order that he might serve God in Eastern Europe. God opened doors one after the other until he was in Moscow. And there the church began to grow and people came to faith in Jesus Christ, our own Aaron Bjorn Arneson from the music college was there in Ronnie Stevens' church and saw something of it. And then after two years, his wife became ill, 
and the doctor said there is no possibility of her getting better so long as you are here in Moscow. And you must go home. And he pled with God and prayed and cried to God that somehow she might be healed and they might go back into this work together which was his very lifeblood. And the answer, of course, as many of you know, was that this was not going to be God's providence and purpose. And the ministry which he loved and the people whose names, as he said to me, were carved deeply into my heart as my own children's. They had to leave them. And they are now home. Some of you sat there and listened to Elizabeth Elliot when she was here in this church speaking about the glorious prospects that lay before herself and her husband around the late 1940s and into 1950. God was calling them to Ecuador to work amongst the Auca Indians. And they looked with a sense of great expectation. Jim Elliot seemed to be the one man who was being prepared for this kind of thing. And did they pray? Of course they prayed. Did they know anything of the power of God? Of course they did in their own lives. And they went out and did it wisely and took counsel from other people. And you know the result of the story was that Multitudes of people all over the world heard that the Auka Indians had speared him and his companions to death before they even got close to them. But you would remember if you heard Elizabeth Elliot saying, they may have meant it for evil, but God meant it for good. And there is always, for God's people, there is that. But the power of God always has the last word. And one of the ways that was begun to be seen was when a group of people came into a conference some years later in Europe and they were introduced, these new believers are Auka Indians brought to faith in Jesus Christ. It's for this reason that one of the early church figures said the blood of the martyrs is the seed of the church. Finally, Peter, here if anywhere in this chapter you see the power of Satan and the power of God ranged over against one another. On the one side there were the chains, an iron gate padlocked, and four companies of four soldiers each, two of them chained to him, one on either side, two of them adding a sentry duty at the door. And then the angel of God came and nudged him. It's a beautiful picture. And the chains fell off. And Peter arose from sleep and was led out to the church which was engaged in praying. The power of God which they sought was made known to them in answer to prayer. There is no power in God's universe, neither in earth or hell, like the 
power of the living God. And you and I, my dear friends, may be brought into contact with it in the same place that the early church touched the power of God. And that's in the place of prayer. Why is it that we see so little of the power of God in the church in Scotland in our generation? I think at least one of the reasons is that in our life as a church and in our thinking as Christian people, prayer is supplemental. For them, it was fundamental. And until that misalignment is changed, I doubt if we shall see much of the power of God in our generation. And that would be one of the greatest tragedies of Christian history. But if we learn the lessons of the Church of God in this generation, who is to say how many generations yet unborn may be affected by it? Let's pray together. Father, we bow before you, deeply conscious of our own need and of the, of the need of the Church of Christ in our generation. Come in your great mercy and grant that our eyes may be opened and our perspective changed and our priorities corrected that we may yet again know the power of God in the midst of his people for the glory of our Lord Jesus Christ. Amen.